Okay, so I thought of my title before I the, actually wrote the, the talk, and, and you now I think I would have done it differently. Uh, but what we're going to talk a little bit about is um, how to build teams from, from populations that are not necessarily what we consider mainstream uh, for hiring technical talent, right? So uh, this is a little bit based on, on my experience building a team uh, at a company called Ride. Uh, I am an engineering manager. I've been building teams for about seven years, uh, also writing software for about eight years. And I had a very unique opportunity to look outside of the common uh, tech bubble to hire and uh, Ash invited me to, to share my experience, so I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, before we, get, we begin, I, I'd like to set the baseline of what, what I consider work class for, for a technology team. And this is mostly, uh, to me, a work class team is a team that can deliver high quality software that is tested, uh, that has low defects, that is delivered on time, um, and that it works. Um, and when I was at Ride, uh, my board of directors questioned whether our team was world class and they, they actually thought that one of the reasons why we were not growing in users was the possibility that our team was based in Latin America. Um, so we hired a very fancy consulting firm to judge whether our team was world class or was effective or not. And they came back with this, uh, with about like 19 strengths and some gaps and some stuff, but what really made me proud of the team, and the reason why I, it's, it's not just, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, they said that our highly distributed team across continents and time zones were stronger and more collaborative than most co-located teams that they had judged. And they had judged Amazon, and they had worked with Yoro, and they had worked with a lot of New York-based teams, and they were actually impressed. The, the, to the point where the, like, the, the CEO wanted to know how we had actually done it. Uh, so that's just the baseline, and, and it's not just my experience. Uh, it's not an empirical finding. Why did I ever want to do this? Um, so I used to come to work at a company. My, my first startup at, at, in New York um, needed to hire. Right? And we, we were a young company. We had no product. We had no experience, no prominent members, and we needed a lot of talent. Uh, but the, the classic problem is we can't find talent. There's no engineers. There's no designers. There's no technical uh, talent anywhere. So I suggested that we look outside our, our bubble. We were located in New York. We were only looking for talent in New York. It's really hard to compete with uh, companies like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and everyone who is really trying to go after uh, the best talented people and have a lot more money than smaller companies. Um, the response I got was that we can't hire software developers in Latin America. Um, and I came back saying, well, we have a developer who is in London. Um, and what I heard back was, well, you can't compare London to Latin America. I was like, but why? No, you, you can't compare developers in London to those in Latin America. I, I still, I kept asking, why? I come from Latin America, right? I work at this company. Truth is, we won't hire developers in Latin America. Right? Because there's a, a cultural bias. Latin American software is just not as good as in Europe or in US or in India or in other places where we're intellectually better, right? Uh, so I learned and I sort of like woke up to the fact that Latin America was a synonym of nearshoring. This is a new word, but in, in, at that time it was offshoring. And it's mostly, so nearshoring is offshoring, but on the same time zone, so cheaper labor. Um, but lower quality work. And I was biased too, to be honest. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, right? I, this, is, this is me, the, the first talk I ever gave in Colombia was telling Colombian developers that they were not good enough. Um, so the reason why I actually wanted to do this uh, is because I wanted to prove myself wrong and others wrong, right? The, the fact that because you have a team in a non-standard population, it doesn't mean that it's, it, it's it's not as good, or it can't be as good. Why would you ever want to do this? Um, so there's a lot of ongoing conversations about diversity. There, there's not enough. There's, but um, 
we, we are bridges, and, and we'll go a little bit into that, but I, I think there's not enough experience, not enough stories on how other people have actually built diverse teams, diverse communities. There's a lot of, like, demand for it. There's not enough recipes or use, uh, uh, not use cases, uh, study cases, yes, uh, study cases, examples. There's not enough examples of it happening and working and, 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 and metrics on how it's actually better, like what this fancy consulting firm found. Um, so what I would switch in my title is that instead of developing nations, because I, I actually didn't build this team from a developing nation, I built it from New York in developing nations, um, is how can we build world-class teams from marginal, marginalized populations. Um, so this was me, right? I was in the middle of Latin American developers and American developers. And I was able to take advantage of that and look and open up a world that no other company had to bring in a lot of people. And you are in the middle of the mainstream, right? We're here in New York in Microsoft, which is one of the most popular companies, technology companies, but we also have access to um, populations that no one is really looking at. Looking at. And, 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 and even to the point where they may be considered not good, like lowering the bar, uh, and we want to change that. This is the first version of the right team. Uh, this was three months after I started. Only the, fir the, the four people in the front row uh, were hired before me. Uh, everyone else was hired after me. So in three months, we hired about 12 technologies, te technologists. Um, and what I was able to prove to the board of directors um, and the executives is that finding and retaining talent outside of our bubbles was a competitive advantage. Because when we needed to grow really, really, really fast, this is the team 12 months later, we were uh, about 35 people. Um, we were able to do it faster than anyone without outside recruiting, without anything, any external help under budget. We came, we, we were about 70%, we spent about 70% less money uh, than many other companies. We didn't pay uh, like offshore consulting rates. I actually made sure that we were paying very similar rates to New York. Um, but we were able to compete faster. We were able to grow faster to have better talent than other people. And we, we had 95% retention rate in, in our employees. Um, so a little bit of what we'll go here is, is how we did it. Because I don't think that I built this team. I think after I started hiring people, the team started building itself. Um, and that's something that's, that was very, very important. And I, and I think that you can do it too. It's a lot of work. Uh, but there's there's... A few things that I think anyone can do uh, to build their own teams. First of all, there's there's some necessary basic infrastructure that we needed, and and this one is really hard to get, which was leadership buy-in. Um, and what what I was particularly lucky of being it was being in a position where I could actually argue and have come in with a business proposition that took a, a, that, that took away any objections about populations or location or costs or anything else. It's like, I, I can make this. Um, and I had trust. So these are basic infrastructures, and if you don't have these as a manager, then your work is going to be really, really, really hard. And, and you should probably be looking in a place where you have those, uh, because if not, you're not going to be able to actually deliver your, your work. Um, I had a budget. I had uh, a budget that was uh, the standard budget for a New York uh, startup. We had, we had funding. We were uh, private equity backed, but uh, so Ride was the innovation shop of an existing enterprise company, and we had, we had good funding. Um, the other thing that we needed was the understanding that remote work is not the same as, distributed, as, a, as a distributed company. Um, V-Ride, which was the parent company of Ride, was uh, a national company. It had offices in pretty much every state, and by definition, we were distributed. It was 30 years old, so they had been doing work. Uh, as a distributed company for 30 years old, even though it was it, for 30 years, even though they were an enterprise. And that helped me, I, I didn't have a lot to fight against the, the culture of having people somewhere else. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a distributed organization, but it makes it easier for uh, marginalized people uh, who, uh, who are probably in the middle of America, who, who can't get access to these opportunities, you can expand yourself. Even um, in the city, you can, you can make it easier for others. I needed a pipeline, and this is, um, 
the, the, the tricky one, right? This is, this is uh, I think, one of the things that made the biggest difference for us because um, before I joined Ride, I had spent about five years building a community in, in Latin America, a community of engineers and, and developers and designers in Latin America. I started doing conferences and events and in, in, in sort of like building this. I, I say that I spent, it took me five years to hire my first high class team, which was this one. Um, and this is what you can do, but this is what really takes a lot of work. And, and, and I think an example of this is uh, Ash, for example. She's, she's positioned right now in a, in a place where she can build whatever team she wants because she has been building this for a while. Uh, and if you really want to do this, you ha you're going to have to put the effort into building a community uh, of the people who you want to hire. There's, there's no shortcut. There's no job posting that by changing the language is going to uh, make it easier for you if, you if you don't really have the trust of this community. Um, then you're going to go into sourcing and selection. And this is, uh, I, I think there's enough writing of this uh, on how to uh, select talent, so I'm, I'm not going to go a lot into it, but what, what is important after sourcing and selecting your talent is sales. You have to convince, you, you have to do two things. You have to convince them in the opportunity and why your company is better than something else, but also you have to sell them why they are the right person for the job, because sometimes you're going to find yourself against imposter syndrome, people who don't think that they are actually, they actually deserve this job. But what, the biggest challenge I had going into Latin America, in, in, into Barranquilla, which is a small town in Colombia, and in convincing one engineer, they, they, they felt there was, there was something, that was, I was hiding something. They couldn't understand why I wanted to give them $80,000 a year, which is probably about like 30 times or 40 times the minimum wage, the, the, the wage that they would get in, in Colombia, and, and give them a job when they they had never had this experience. They had never worked for a company in, in the United States. So I had to do a lot of selling them themselves on it. Uh, and it is very important that you can actually do it. Um, then the, has, the onboarding and training was very, very different because I had to use culture shock. Um, it's... So having to deal with people who are... In, in, in places where we consider that the bar is lower uh, means that you have to make them believe that it isn't lower, right? And what I had to do was the program, so um, in Latin America, you have a lot of these nearshoring um, shops. And what people are conditioned to is that the, the only thing that matters is the time that they are writing software. And they're actually clocked, they have software that looks at their screens. They have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. They, if they are not billing, they are not working. They are not being productive. And what I discovered with the first few people when we did our offsite was that once, once we took an hour and 15 minutes lunchtime, they started feeling very uncomfortable. They started looking at the time. They felt like they had to be working. It's like, why are we not working? And, and I actually long I started seeing them very uncomfortable looking at their clock like we have to work we have to work and we actually took a two and a half hour lunch and they were shocked uh, I remember uh, Alexander he was from Brazil he, he worked in in, 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 a, in a consulting company he's like I have never in my life in the past five years taken more than 30 minutes for lunch why are we doing this like this is we're wasting our time it's like we're actually building a team this is more valuable than any code that you could have written in the past three months um, and, and at that moment, I realized that I had to do a lot of deprogramming in my onboarding, showing that what mattered more was that we would actually think about what we were going to build and not the time that we were actually spend, spending uh, writing software. Um, and then the way I did it, and I found a recipe of t uh, basically taking any uh, offshoring uh, engineer into a product engineer was I would give them trust. I would tell them, within the first two weeks of them starting their job, I would give them a very hard uh, task of building, building either an endpoint or a screen, something that they, that they could do, but they had not been given a chance before. Uh, I would give their goals, like this is the flow that you have to complete. Here's your team, here's your tools. Uh, 
and then I would teach them how to set expectations. And I would basically say, like, here's your project. I'm not going to make you do estimates or points. I'm not going to tell you when to start your job. You Just tell me how you want to do it, when you're going to do it. Usually, they would overestimate. Uh, the, the, they would underestimate the, the, the amount of effort, and, and they would not gen generally reach their objectives. But I use that as a tool, as a, as a tool to recover the confidence in them and to teach them how to actually manage their expectations and be engineers and not just uh, pro people who write code. Um, and within three months, everyone was actually thinking more about the business and the product than the code that they were writing. Um, so it was, it, w it was very, very cool to see, to see that happen. And, and, and afterwards, teaching them how to manage me, how to manage, how to, how to tell me when they were going to complete their, their tasks and what they actually needed from them. Everyone had a 500 uh, open expense account. They could, if they considered that they had an expense that would make their jobs easier, like some software or an account, uh, they were free to use it. They had a lot of responsibility. And that completely shocked the world because they had none before. Um, and then with that, we were able to set the team values, right? I, I think I approved expenses probably three times and no one really actually had to use it. But, they, but if they had the opportunity, uh, if they had the need, they had the, the, the tools to do it. So it was, it was really great. Uh, another uh, couple of things that we had to do was, so we, we set the team values, right? Respect. We, there was a... Um, a code of conduct, so to say. It was hard to get past HR, <laughs> um, but we, we made it happen. And um, everyone felt welcome once we sort of it became a part of onboarding, like here's how we build software and here's how we treat each other as a team. That was extremely, extremely valuable. We also set communication guidelines, right? Because uh, uh, now we were going across language barriers and sometimes... Um, Humor in Latin America is very inappropriate, uh, and, and, and it doesn't translate. And it so, so I had a lot. Uh, we had a lot to do as far as community management, which was not ill-intentioned, but it, but there was a cultural barrier, right? There, there was not an understanding that uh, saying a certain joke was inappropriate, uh, or that several sexist comments were actually sexist. Or that saying guys was non-inclusive. So, but but after a while, the team was training new people by themselves. It's like, hey, you don't say this. Uh, even consultants who would come out from outside would be shocked. It's like, why is why why are you so inclusive here? It, it, it was it was it was pretty pretty cool to see. Um, the last tool I think I gave the team was the room for failure. Um, if, if we expect that we're going to to try to achieve something really really hard we we need to assume that we're that we're risking a lot and if we're risking a lot then we have to have a chance to fail and we failed we failed a lot we we made a lot of mistakes we charged some people sometimes a, a, a lot of money that we shouldn't have and we had to like we, we had a lot of postmortems i think we have a collection right now of 40 or, or 45 postmortems uh, in a repo somewhere um but what what we were able to also teach our team is that it was okay to make mistakes when you're taking risks um, and they were willing to go further in what they were achieving uh, when they felt that the team had their back, when they could fail and not be judged. Uh, and that was extremely important because before uh, people were sort of expected um, to, to not make mistakes. In, in, in Latin America, this, that's very, very prominent. You're, you're expected to know everything and to be the expert. Uh, and, and, and that was something that helped. G giving a room for failure was, was something very helpful. Um, support, uh, this is generally just uh, giving uh, emotional support and this is more of a managerial task, one-on-ones uh, -on -ones and, and, and just stuff we, 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 we talk uh, mostly about uh, being good management. Um, and time, I think if I would have, <laughs> If I would have done it differently, the, the thing that I would have done is not grow that fast. Hiring 35 people within 14 months is really, really challenging, especially when you're doing it uh, all over the, the world. Um, I, I wish I would have had, been, had more time to dedicate to a lot more people. 
Um, so that's that's something like if you're going to try to do this, try to not rush it. Um, so what I learned is that hiring privileged people is less work. Um, I could have had an easier two years, so right shut down, unfortunately. Um, but I could have had an easier two years. It would have hired here because I had the money to do it. But it was more rewarding to, to actually prove that um, that we could build a, a better team somewhere else. Um, I also learned that if I don't do this work, and if we don't do this work, that no one else is going to do it for us. Right? As, as much as we can ask for diversity and for diverse people who are in positions of power are not interested in, in, in our communities. Uh, and, and probably right now it's becoming a marketing uh, uh, strategy to pretend that you want to have a diverse team, but it's but th but there's not, it, it's not true. And, and unless we do it, we, we can't expect others to do this work for us. Um, there's a real competitive advantage in hiring people from marginalized populations. No one is looking to hire here. There, it, it, there is virtually untapped talent, and um, you can act, you, you you can have a better team. I don't know. Um, if you ever saw the, the, the Moneyball strategy or the, the, that movie, but you, you can have a better team by looking at, at populations that no one else is looking at. It, it, it is a real competitive advantage uh, from a business perspective, and you can sell it to leadership teams that way. This work pays off for my company. Uh, we were able to grow a team faster than many companies in New York would have wanted or would have uh, wished uh, with less money. We, we actually did it under budget. Um, this work paid off for my people. Uh, so if we talk about statistics. Uh, out of the 35 uh, people in the right technology team, 80% were Latin American um, in from four or five different nationalities. Um, only one of them worked for an American company before, so they earned in dollars before. And today, everyone who has a job works for, for a company either in Europe or in the US, and they are uh, part of the of their A class team. So everyone, we also, they were also able to use this, to use their ride experience as a stepping stone. And even though before ride, they would have never considered that they would even belong in a company in the United States. Right now, they actually feel like they deserve it and they, they have the ability to, to work in a way. Um, so I was wrong. You can compare um, a developer from, from England to a developer from Latin America. And they can even work on the same team. 